El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Elyon Adonai. Age to age was still the same by the power of the name. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, Er Kan Kan Adonai. We will praise and lift you high. El Shaddai. <laughs> Scripture lesson for today is Genesis thirty seven, three through eleven. Jacob loved Joseph more than any of his other children because Joseph had been born to him in his old age. So one day, Jacob had a special gift made for Joseph, a beautiful robe. But his brothers hated Joseph because their father loved him more than the rest of them. They couldn't say a kind word to him. One night, Joseph had a dream, and when he told his brothers about it, they hated him more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were, in a, we were out in a field, tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, So you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. Soon Joseph had another dream, and again he told his brothers about it. Listen, I have had another dream, he said. The sun, moon, and eleven stars bowed low before me. This time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? But while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> that Joseph, he is something, isn't he? Week three of our the Bible year exploration finds us at the end of the stories of the patriarchs with the page turning tale of Jacob and his sons, including Joseph and his time in Egypt. Eventually we hear the opening story of Moses and how the story, how the Hebrew people in Egypt plays out through the beginning of Exodus. Before we enter the stories, a reminder of a few things we've learned. This is definitely a different time, place, culture, and context, isn't it? Multiple wives, lots of kids, moving around, kings and empires, and a high level of threat and violence are all part of the Old Testament world. And we have a couple of tools that we've identified to help us as we read. And so, slide. Next slide, Gary. There you go. A particular passage or story might seem to be descriptive, telling us what happened, where and how, and an awful lot of what we've read so far has been descriptive. It's a story, it's a narration of what is happening. It might be prescriptive telling the hearers of the story then and now what to do and how to be a follower of God. One of the places we read this this week is in the Passover story, as God asked the Hebrews to do very particular things to get ready for the Exodus and then tells them they're going to keep doing those. We'll talk a little bit more about that next week, but it's really prescriptive. And then predictive, what will happen if, what will happen when, sometimes it's a consequence, sometimes it's a prophecy, and in our reading again this week is God is telling Moses 
what to do and what will happen and they will harden God's heart. There's some predictive part of the story in that. So prescriptive, descriptive, and predictive kind of help us to figure out what's happening as we read. And um, the other kind of tool that we found is that we're looking for the three-part series that often unfolds. Next slide, Gary. Starts with a call or a blessing from God and then goes to a covenant or promise and followed by rebellion or consequences for breaking that covenant. And that's a rhythm that we see again and again as we move through the story. So that being said, let's pray and get ready to enter in. Please pray with me. El Shaddai, Almighty God, we thank you for this story and for the time to to delve in, to read it in arcs that we might not have before, to compare the words to the pictures in our head and what we learned in Sunday school and from musicals and from reading brief passages through the years. May you just continue to enlarge the story in our minds and our hearts that we may better understand your people through time, that we may better understand the arrival of your son on earth and what that meant, and that we may better know you. We give you all this. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing to you. Amen. We began this week's readings with the continued story of Jacob, the son of Isaac, away from his homeland, his parents, his brother Esau, and his immediate relatives. Jacob Jacob goes to the land of his father's uncle Laban. Mark and I had to spend a few minutes sorting out that family tie (laughs) this morning. And he works for 14 years to earn the right to marry two sisters, first Leah and then Rachel. And he helps his father or his uncle-in-law, I guess, raise crops and livestock, and he makes a home with them. Beautiful Rachel is the apple of his eye and yet has a difficult time conceiving. Plainer Rachel is fruitful and has six sons before Rachel conceives. And as Rachel waits in a familiar story from where we've been already, she asked her servant Bilhah to lie with Jacob. So several years, two wives, two concubines, 12 sons, and one, un- one, known, one known daughter later, we have the family of Jacob. Again, we may not quite understand the context and the culture all of the time, But there's no condemnation for God in this situation. In fact, God keeps blessing it. And that tells us a great deal about the relationship between the people and God and what was the code of the time. The family, Jacob's family, eventually makes their way back to the land of Canaan. It's a little conniving and deceiving by Jacob as he leaves (laughs) Laban's family, kind of reminiscent of what happened back home with Rebecca and Esau with a little wrestling along a river where Jacob claims his own blessing and gains the name Israel. Eventually, Jacob's family is reunited with that of Esau's and they all see Isaac and Rebecca before the matriarch and patriarch of that family pass on. But as we heard earlier, Jacob has one clear favorite son, Joseph, who possesses, I think, the beauty and the charm of Rachel. He's he's the favorite because Rachel is the favorite. As we have learned from the time of Cain and Abel, parental favoritism is not a helpful thing in family dynamics, is it? Keeps getting everybody in trouble. Neither are dreams that indicate your brothers will be bowing down to you in the future. When Jacob gives Joseph that beautiful coat, sometimes described as many colors, it's the straw that breaks the brothers' backs. They first concoct a plan to kill him and leave him in a well to die and finally sell him off to nomadic traders as a slave 
telling a distraught and grieving Jacob that his favorite son is dead. Joseph lands in Egypt in the household of Potiphar, kind of the chief of staff to the Pharaoh, and Joseph is a slave. In that household, Joseph's status and fortune kind of come and go as his charm and ability help him succeed and his looks garner attention from Potiphar's wife that land him in jail for a time. And his skill at dreaming and telling dreams come back to help him. Eventually, famine comes to the land of Jacob and 10 of the remaining sons head to Egypt to buy the grain they have heard is available. Joseph knows who they are right away, but his brothers don't recognize him, and partly he's dressing and being as an Egyptian in this time. Joseph seems to put his brothers through some tests, and he plays a bit of cat and mouse with them as he deals with what I think are some really big feelings, as my daughter's family would say, there's big feelings all over in Joseph. But ultimately, he softens his heart. There's just a couple passages where he breaks down in tears away from the scene just to kind of deal and let his heart soften once again. God affirms um, this reunion with his brothers and his father and the move uh, to Egypt for Jacob and his family and offers his blessing in that once more feels like whenever there's a big choice to be made, a move kind of away from what we might think the expected path is, now they're moving away from the land of Canaan. Why are they doing that? Well, they don't have any food. They don't have any grain. They're starving. So the Pharaoh and Joseph invite them to relocate to a fertile part of the kingdom, Goshen, and 70 of them or so do so. Let's see if I can. All right with my pointer for a minute. So if we look at kind of this region, we have Jerusalem and Bethel and Shechem, and we heard those names a lot. So this is kind of what we think of as Israel, the Dead Sea, the Sea of Galilee is up there. So this is the region of the New Testament and Joseph. But um, the traders kind of take Joseph along the shore and down into Egypt, which is across the Sinai Peninsula, as it remains and still on the Mediterranean Sea. And this is the Nile. So the biggest city in Egypt is right at the Nile Delta. It's fertile, there's lots of water, um, it's easy to grow crops there, and then Goshen is kind of this land up here. So that's kind of the geography of this story at this point, and we'll see that next week as we start talking about how uh, the Israelites get from here back to there in the, in the Exodus. So Gary, maybe just go back to the title slide for a bit. So I had to ponder a bit about the place of God in this story. It's really more like a page-turning narrative what happens next, what happens next. And as I thought about it, at this point the Hebrew people are really just operating on several blessings from God, the covenant of circumcision that they have made, and a lot of marked memorials to God through Canaan and kind of down along this pathway. It feels like whenever God moves in mighty ways, one of these patriarchs builds some sort of memorial or monument to God that are named. I don't know how well they really know this God who keeps showing up in big ways and then sort of disappearing for a time, letting them fumble their way through. There's not really a religion in any sense yet. The Ten Commandments and all that follows are waiting on Mount Sinai for another hero and another day. Yet there is some sense of God and of destiny for Joseph. One of the phrases that reoccurs again and again in this narrative is, and God was with him. So Joseph knew God was with him. The tellers of the story knew that God was with him. After Jacob's death, 
in Egypt, the brothers are afraid that Joseph will give them some very earned payback for their behavior earlier. Instead, Joseph says this in chapter 50, don't be afraid of me. Am I God that I can punish you? You intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. And so we're remembering that the dreams that Joseph interpreted in Egypt led to some stockpiling of grain. And that grain is what's being shared with his family and brothers and the ability to survive in Egypt is the gift that he is giving. Don't know what happened, would have happened to Jacob's family had they remained in the land of Canaan instead of going to Egypt. We are told Jacob, Joseph lived until 110 in the land of Egypt alongside Jacob's family, seeing three generations grow and multiply around him. God is in this story for the long haul. You know, we've gone from pretty tight, small families to 70 people coming in and um, being fruitful over generations. And a side note before we continue, we may all have some fictionalized versions of these stories that live large in our minds and hearts. Years ago, I enjoyed a book by Anita Diamante called The Red Tent that is told through the perspective of the women in the Jacob story from Rachel and Leah, Bilhah and Zipporah, not Zipporah. Zilha. we're just gonna go with the Z, the Z woman. And their children, but their thoughts and their perspective and how their lives were. Mark and I enjoy musicals and Andrew Lloyd Webber's Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat is a favorite. We rewatched it again last weekend, and I was reminded of how closely some parts stick to the text and story, and how the songs and the live action that are added just kind of illuminate it for me, much like happened with A Christmas Carol, right? A lot of that followed the text, and then there were other things that kind of brought it to life. And Moses and the Exodus is a story we may know best from movies. The Ten Commandments, did I remember watching that every year around Easter when I was a kid? The Prince of Egypt or Exodus, God and Kings. And it's recounted in the Jewish Passover meal and there are echoes in every communion that we celebrate together. And differing versions of the story do help me expand my imagination about what might have been, again, different contexts and time and culture but I've really enjoyed reading alongside of that to really know what is written and kind of compare the two in my mind. I think we all have to decide if creative imaginings of the stories expand our idea of what might have been or if they limit it. I was reminded as I read though that this is an oral tradition for centuries and it's not too hard to imagine a wandering storyteller adding music and props and life to this page turning what happens next story. Now we literally turn the page and move out of Genesis into Exodus. At the end of Genesis, Joseph is aging and we're talking about the generations. As we begin the book of Exodus, Joseph has died. The Pharaoh who he served has died. And all those who remember how he came to be in Egypt and how Joseph helped Egypt to survive have also died. The Hebrews who have remained there have continued to thrive and multiply and grow within the Egyptian kingdom for about 350 years, 20 or so generations since the time of Joseph. Does, can you, do you know stories 20 generations ago? Could you point to the facts 20 generations ago? The Hebrews are slaves. They're useful, but they're despised. They're not Egyptian, to be sure. And that was a bit of a purebred kind of culture. They are so fruitful that the Egyptians are threatened by their numbers. 
The Pharaoh in this part of the story gives Jewish midwives an order to kill the baby boys, which they bravely ignored. So he followed it with an order for all newborn Hebrew boys to be thrown into the Nile. Enter Moses the hero on a hero's journey. Moses the spared baby in a basket. Moses who grew up a member in the court of Pharaoh, the ruler, the king, the intermediary for the gods was Pharaoh, commander in chief of all Egypt. Moses who grew up with a foot in both worlds, perhaps not quite knowing who he was and how he fit in. Moses who killed an Egyptian in outrage over injustice and fled the country. Moses who came to rest in the foreign land of Midian, married the Pora, and became a shepherd. Moses who saw a burning bush and very, very, very reluctantly heard and followed God's call to go and free the Hebrew people. Isn't there anyone else you can send, says Moses. But I think there was for Moses, his own call to freedom in this. The Exodus story is all about freedom and liberation from bondage. But there was a call to Moses. Freedom to finally claim his own heritage and connect with his Hebrew roots and family. Freedom from the fear of being killed that remained from his flight to Egypt, from Egypt freedom to find his voice, his leadership, and who God created him to be. After Moses returns to Egypt, he connects with his brother Aaron and sister Miriam. He is asked for Aaron to be the spokesperson of this duo. And Moses and Aaron go to speak to the Pharaoh as the Lord had said and told him, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people go so they may hold a festival in my honor in the wilderness. Pharaoh's heart, however, remained hard, and he refused to listen. And so the plagues begin. The water of the Nile and all surface water turned into blood and the fish died, and Pharaoh's heart was hard. Moses asks again, and Pharaoh denies, and there is a plague of frogs. This one always makes me laugh a little bit until I read about and imagine for a minute the piles of stinking dead frogs. And Pharaoh hardened his heart, and the plague of gnats arrived. And Pharaoh would not listen, and Moses asked, and the plague of flies arrived everywhere but in the land of Goshen, where the Hebrew people lived. And God made a distinction between his people and Pharaoh's people. Then the livestock of the Egyptians became diseased and died, and the Egyptian people became covered with festering boils, followed by the worst hailstorm that had ever come to Egypt, followed by locusts who ate the crops in a darkness that covered all of Egypt for three days. And still, Pharaoh would not let these people go. And in the rhythm of this story, which is poetry kind of in its own right, Moses and Aaron, this is the one depiction of the hailstorm. Part of what I loved about that is just this idea of this as a metropolis in a way maybe I hadn't imagined, but just the, the might and the power of that hailstorm in the Egyptian landscape. But in this rhythm, Moses and Aaron consistently followed God's instructions to ask for freedom for the Hebrew people to go and worship God. Sometimes Pharaoh appears to allow this and then either adds a condition or changes his mind. In all of the plague narratives, it either says that Pharaoh's heart remained hardened or that the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. What does all of that mean? Why would God continue to escalate? That was the only word I can think of. This is just escalation, right? Does God have the power to harden or to soften Pharaoh's heart? 
I think that there are also invitations and calls to freedom in this part of the narrative for the Hebrew people and for Pharaoh. Not just for the Hebrew people to be freed, but to find their way to freedom. At this point, slavery is all that they have known for 20 generations. This is life. This is where their people are, their things are, things are. To let go of what they have known, what may seem like a painful but secure existence. After the first plague, Pharaoh raises the workload on the Hebrew slaves and they push back hard against Moses. Why are you making our lives harder? They too had to be convinced of the power and the faithfulness of God. And Pharaoh too is being offered a kind of freedom. Freedom from being an oppressor of people. To acknowledge a God that is bigger than he is. You can see that wrestling and read that wrestling in the story. Pharaoh is God. He is the ruler of all the gods. And here is a God who has more power than he is. There are a couple places he asks for a blessing from that God and then denies it again. He's really having to figure this out. Pharaoh has the freedom to listen to his own heart and he doesn't in a place of hardening and softening there. And there's another answer to this escalation that can be found in Exodus 10. Then the Lord God said to Moses, go into Pharaoh for I have hardened his heart that I may show these signs of mine among him, among them, and that you may tell them in the hearing of your children and your children's children how I have toyed with the Egyptians and what signs I have done among them that you may know I am the Lord. So it appears that one of God's larger purposes in all of this is to make God's power and might known. How should I? In a way that no one will again forget. To create a story that will be told again and again and every year across generations and centuries and really millennia because here we are telling the story. And we remember it's a story out of ancient history and a culture without written language, yet this story is incredibly detailed, vivid, celebrated, remembered, and it's such an essential part of our Hebraic tradition and our understanding of God's character. This is a God of covenant, of power, of might, and of freedom. What can we learn from this? What can we take from this part of the story for our own lives? From this odd narrative of plagues and persistence? We could start with the question, what would a plague look like in our own 21st century lives? But I think we answered that a few years ago. We've seen it in the Flint water crisis. We've seen it in the coronavirus and what happened out of that. But a plague may look like divorce, addiction, foreclosure, job loss, the unexpected death of a loved one. Just one of those modern day plagues can rock us back on our heels. What does it mean? What should we do? We endure, we mourn, we respond and react, we battle, we give up. Perhaps our hearts soften a bit towards others in similar circumstances. But our questions offer often, why now? Why me? Perhaps one of the responses to the situation is our own hardening of heart. I'll never trust anyone again. Love is not worth it. I guess life will not get better. I'm not going to believe anyone. If the situation improves, our memories dim, the pain lessens, and we begin to forget. We forget our own story years ago, much less our ancestors 20 generations ago, until, of course, the next plague or the next wave of the same plague comes again. I can't tell you how many times I've asked the question when faced with the umpteenth iteration of a situation, what is God trying to teach me? What am I failing to learn? But perhaps the question needs to be, from what is God trying to free me? There's an old axiom that says this, we don't change until the cost or pain of staying the same 
exceeds the pain of changing. But what if walking through the pain of change brings you to new freedom? What if the God who rescued the chosen people from slavery and rescued you? What if you knew, really knew, that Jesus was by your side in all things? What if you knew, really knew, that people who care about you will help and bear your burden if you ask them? What if you knew, really knew, that nothing can separate you from the love and the grace of God? Could you move through even the toughest of plagues and toward the freedom that God gives you with your back strong and your heart soft? And what if, as Christ calls us to love God ourselves and one another, the greatest act of faith is to keep our hearts soft in every circumstance, to let the love of God flow in and soften our hearts and let that flow out into the world. May we, people of God, walk through life together with strong backs and soft hearts toward the freedom and adventure of our own exodus. Please pray with me. God, may we hear your call to freedom from those things that enslave us. Fear, hurt, anger, anxiety, habit, doubt, sin. All of the things that separate us from you. May we recognize our plagues as invitations to let go and follow you to the promised land. 